pleasure to be here. I'm not always going to be behind the computer here and have some notes because I was making notes during the previous talk. Uh, and the slideshow is brand new too, so I might be referring back to it a few times. Uh, I have uh, as well a mnemonic for remembering my name. Uh, like, say, Chuck. Uh, the first name, Stephen. So you remember Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Last name is Downs. You know where this is going. Remember Downs. And it's worked for me. I'm sure it'll work for you. Uh, really interesting talk. I liked it a lot. Um, it comes from a cognitivist perspective, uh, obviously. I come from a different perspective. Uh, and that different perspective informs a lot of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so, I just want to frame it a wee bit. You told the story about the elephant and the rider. Uh, the elephant is like our lizard brain, and the rider is like our executive brain, if you will. My theory is a bit different. There is no rider. It's all elephant, all the way down. <laughs> and if you think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? If you want the system of elephant plus rider to move a tree trunk, what do you train? The elephant or the rider? Yeah. Both. Well, both, okay. I want you to look at it. Okay, that was that I thought of that one about 10 minutes ago, and that was my first, I'll never use that line again. <laughs> um, think of this system from the elephant's perspective. And it's important that you do, because it is the only perspective that matters in this system. For the elephant, the rider is nothing more than a tool that the elephant uses in order to get food. <laughs> All right, that's enough of the last minute thoughts. But, but it's a serious consideration. Now, uh, this, this also was in my uh, bucket list to come to a military base and show cat pictures. <laughs> <laughs> One of the work that I've done uh, recently has revolved around the area of personal learning, personal learning technologies. The development of the MOOC was uh, an instantiation of that. The idea, and uh, it was brought up really well, the example of the Kenyan javelin thrower who learned to throw using YouTube, uh, of how people can learn for themselves. And the idea of the MOOC was to help people learn for themselves. Now, I want you to think of this case. I ran across this the other day. Um, this is a real thing. It's not something I made up, but it is something I found on Reddit. High school student writes in. He says, I've been given an assignment of using artificial intelligence to optimize the traffic flow in our school. And that's the picture of the school. It's a pretty big school. But you see the green arrows and anyhow. Uh, and I thought that was pretty neat. But what struck me is how many of you were given an assignment in high school to use artificial intelligence to optimize the traffic flows? Yeah, pretty much none of us, right? And that's the thing we need to be careful about, right? We had, I, until a week ago, had no idea that this would be an assignment, let alone part of one of my slides. Uh, yet, there it is. And there is this difficulty about planning for this kind of future where something completely out of left field is going to come at you. Now, you've probably heard that before, but to me, this goes right to the heart of designing learning. And just as an aside, I'm going to kind of speak to you all 
today as though you are instructors or learning designers. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. Doesn't matter, right? Just think of me as speaking to that perspective, but draw from that the message that's relevant to you. Second aside, don't worry about remembering what I'm going to say. You won't. I won't. And I'm not saying it. <laughs> Right? Uh, the, the point here isn't to give you stuff to remember. The point here is to give you stuff to think about. If you think about something, then I've been a success. Uh, if you leave this talk with no new ideas at all, and I'm hoping I've already accomplished that with the there is no elephant, uh, then it hasn't been a success. Third thing, uh, do feel free to interrupt me, ask questions, yell, no, no, that's not true, or he's a witch, or whatever. <laughs> uh, I'm good with that. I've been called much worse. All right. So, I, I wanted to use an example of, well, what about people who are out in the field? And I thought, no, I know nothing about being out in the field. But I do know about traffic, um, having driven here through some of Toronto's northern traffic. When a person is in traffic, and they're trying to figure out the optimal way of getting through the parking lot. It's not about what you want to teach them. It's about what they need to know, right? And it's not about what you can do for them because you're not there. It's about what they can do for themselves. And to me, that is the essence of personal learning. How do we recognize learning in that kind of environment? Um, I'm not going to go into the debate about competencies, but I will say that the outcome of learning isn't acquired capacity, skills, competencies, etc. The outcome of learning is a person. And it's a person in a specific kind of configuration. Detail, detail, detail. Uh, and the way we know whether somebody has learned is not by ticking off the boxes. Can they do this? Can they do that? Can they do that? We know, as trainers, the way you know they've learned is you recognize that they've learned. You watch them go out and do something in the field, you can tell. How does that happen? All right. You need to change I hate saying it like that. You need to do this. Uh, here's a different way of looking at things. Um, that was me being self-corrective. You can see how I can get myself off track by being self-corrective, right? Uh, a, a different way of looking at things. The, the elephant rider perspective is I'm stuck in traffic. The elephant perspective is I am traffic. It's a very elephant attitude to have. Um, okay, I'm going to stop trying to mix the elephant and traffic metaphor. Okay. To the end of this point, a guy called Cedric Price, who I also only learned about this week, although he was designing architecture and buildings in the previous century. Uh, Price was designing not for the uses he wished to see, not for the use case, not even for the minimal viable product, um, but for all of the uses he couldn't imagine. Uh, in the technical world, we call that affordances. When I design learning system, I design for affordances. I design not with a specific outcome in mind, but with an idea of maximizing the possible outcomes that there could be. Um, the way I like to say it, and I've said this a lot, uh, maybe too much, we built a multi-trillion dollar communications infrastructure. And I was back there at the beginning of that, I was working with company called Geophysical Services Incorporated, a branch of Texas Instruments, and we had a thing called Remote Job Entry, and this was in 1980, um, before a lot of this internet stuff became famous, 
Uh, and was for sending seismic data back and forth. We used it for things like playing chess. And Texas Instruments, instead of looking at that use and say, hey, people might want to play chess with each other over long distances, they kicked me off the system. <laughs> Uh, when the internet was developed, the first and probably foremost use of it today is to send cat pictures back and forth. If we had designed a system for sending cat pictures back and forth, it would have looked very different from the internet. Uh, if we had designed the global communication system, we probably wouldn't have started with the use case of sending cat pictures. Yet, that's what happened. And to me, <coughs> That's the beauty of it. To me, the reason why the internet works is we can send cat pictures. And nobody planned for it, didn't expect it to happen. Now we can do it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to talk about the future of learning technologies. Um, so, obligatory remark about virtual reality, extended reality, and all of that, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> that's existing technology. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I've talked about over the years about personal learning technology, etc., that's existing technology. It uh, didn't come up so much in the previous talk the way I did, I expected rather, but ADL is building something called the Total Learning Architecture. Uh, they're building something called the Competencies and Skills System. They're building something called the Personal Learning Assistant, or is it the other way, Personal Assistant for Learning? I always forget. Pow. Pow, it is PAL, right. Ours was called the Personal Learning Assistant. All of that either exists or is in the process of coming into existence. And, um, I'm not so interested in that. I mean, I'm really interested in it, but it's not the future anymore. I'm focused on the future. So what's happening in the future is what I'm going to be talking about here. First thing that's happening in the future, pulling from what's happening in what is always the future, the gaming area, is the combination of experience and reflection. How many of you have heard of Fortnite? Yeah. Love Fortnite, right? You go in there, you're in with a group of 100 people, you're into the scenario, and then you're shot. I'm just talking about my own experience. <laughs> but what's really cool is, now, now you're a spectator. Right? And you watch the rest of the Fortnite thing. Right? The experience and the reflection on the experience are part of the same thing. What makes Fortnite great is, that your experience doesn't completely consist of simply being shot, but you can watch Fortnite games, people stream Fortnite games. I've watched a lot of Fortnite. It's not really my thing. My thing is something called No Man's Sky. Love it. 300 hour love. <laughs> um, and so what's happening, if we want to transfer that concept to the educational technology sphere is we're beginning to blend the idea of content and creation. Content is your experience of playing the game, your experience of going out there, shooting other people, getting shot, or flying a spaceship around, whatever. And the creation is the creation of the recording, the creation of fan sites, in my case, the No Man's Sky Wiki. It's a really awkward name for a game. Um, all kinds of things. Livecaster, Twitch, Open Broadcaster. These are names you might have seen. People are using these things to create content as they play the game. And it's as easy as on Windows. Uh, if you hit the Window key and G, um, you're now streaming your game. It's that easy. Okay, you have to set it up a little bit first, but uh, that's a five minute thing. And of course, there's a YouTube video. Um, same sort of thing is happening in the world of learning technology. Uh, Workbench, um, that's the, 
Sorry, that's the wrong text for that slide. This is what happens when you make the slides at the last minute. Uh, what that text actually says, don't believe your eyes, is that learning tools, interoperability, is a way of combining, a way of creating content with consuming content. In particular, the LTI WordPress plugin is a plugin for any learning management system such that you're in there, you're taking your course, you click the button, now you're in your WordPress environment, you're writing a blog. Click another button, now you're back in your course, your course knows that you've created the blog and it's now communicating it to other people. Combination, content, and creativity. Here's another example of creating and learning in a single environment. Looks like a pretty neat animation, right? Uh, it's just your standard logic circuit with OR gates and AND gates and things like that. We actually used stuff like that in the 1980s, except we didn't have a nice neat animated GIF like this. This actually, and if you follow the link, um, you could actually play with this yourself. This is actually an interactive thing where if you click on any of the gates, you can toggle and change the gate. And you can change the on-off switches at the input end. So that you can actually build your own circuits just by clicking on the gates and then save the circuit that you built. What could you use it for? I don't know. There's got to be some use. If nothing else, now you know what AND gates and OR gates do. <laughs> New types of learning resources. <coughs> this is something called Jupyter Notebooks. How many of you have heard of Jupyter Notebooks? Guy at the back? Tech guy. <laughs> uh, so what a Jupyter Notebook is, take your, your typical text processing application, right? Um, you know, Word or WordPad or whatever. Um, and you're working on something, you might want to put some computer code into that. And then somebody thought, well, wouldn't it be a neat idea if that code actually worked? That's what Jupyter Notebooks is. Uh, it's a notebook, but you type computer code into it, and then you can hit a little run button. The code actually executes, and then you see the output. And if you want, you can change the code and you get a different output. And you can save these, trade these. <clears throat> There's a whole ecosystem of Jupyter Notebooks out there that people are using to try out code ideas, etc. Now what's really interesting about Jupyter Notebooks is it's not just code plus computer back, or you know, not just code plus text. It's real functioning code that functions on the internet. So <clears throat> I'll mess up the camera people here. This is real data coming from a live third party source. If this data changes, even if you didn't change the code, your output's going to change. So, content, the idea of content isn't just instructional content. In fact, the more we think of the concept of instructional content in this kind of environment, the less it makes sense. What would instructional content look like in a Jupyter Notebook? Well, maybe a how to program in Python thing, but that gets old after the first week. Really what you're interested in is the notebook for doing this, the notebook for doing that, the notebook for doing that. In this case, uh, the notebook for, I'm trying to read the text as it goes by, uh, demographics in the United States, or whatever that is. Uh, you can actually try it out. If you hit that link there, jupiter.org slash try, there's a thing called Binder, uh, and what Binder does is it allows you to run Jupyter Notebooks in your web browser. So wherever you are, you can access and run a Jupyter Notebook using live data, creating real-time results. I wanted to do one for the presentation, but it's just not going to work. 
Workbench, something I've looked at, haven't investigated deeply, but it takes the same kind of idea. It's uh, free and open source data journalism. In this, just as an aside, when I'm talking about this stuff, you'll hear free and open source a lot. All of this stuff is free and open source. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't really make sense if it's not free and open source because you get data, you got computer bits, uh, code that you can edit on the fly, notebooks that you can just type types to, type text in. Where is the proprietary, right? Um, where is the shrink-wrapped package that you buy? It, it wouldn't work with the rest of it. So this is all free and open source. So uh, again, if you follow that link, the bottom link on the slide to uh, workbenchdata.com, you see the course Intro to Data Journalism, free and open course, of course, um, because of MOOC, uh, yay. Um, and it'll step you through, and you can see examples of Workbench doing data journalism on the fly. So. Uh, there's an example looking up crime statistics, associating it with zip code, etc. And again, all using live data. This is where learning is going. Uh, Prepackaged content doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> Just trying to predict the audience reaction. <laughs> All right, seems, this all seems pretty tame so far, right? I mean, it's, it's a mess to work with. It's kind of a bear to learn. But the trolls are getting better and better and better. And, you know, this time in a few years, you'll be using these tools, and you won't even think twice about it. So let's take all of what I just said and connect it to that. This is linked open data, and, and what you're looking at there is the linked open data cloud. Now, um, in, during the introduction, he asked how many of you know about containers and clouds, and like two hands went up. So there's some slides that aren't in this presentation that I need to give you right now. So pretend there's a different slide up there, and it's a slide that talks about the cloud. Now, the cloud is short for someone else's computer. Uh, <laughs> so, what is significant about that is it doesn't matter whose computer, it doesn't matter where it is, it doesn't matter where you are. Here's the concept. This is current thinking. It's, it's rapidly evolved. Take your computer, right, and put a wrapper around it, a software wrapper that pretends it's the hardware but isn't. Uh, it's kind of like the brain in a vat experiment but for computers, right? But you could do that, right? So you have all the input-output stuff and you just use software instead of hardware. Take that, compress it using algorithms, and then put that in the cloud. And then connect your keyboard and your screen to that cloud via, say, the internet. It really is like brain in a box. Would you know you're not working on your own computer? Or no, right? And there might be a little latency because bandwidth, but uh, you know, for the most part, they would look and feel like you're working on your own computer. Uh, if you work for the government, you may have had this experience where your computer doesn't work. No, you have had this experience where your computer doesn't work. <laughs> and someone from computer services says, look, just give me a remote desktop, right? And all of a sudden your cursor starts moving and uh, they find your photos directory, etc. Right? It's almost it's the same experience as that. So. Okay, well for doing that, we can have super efficient computers because my computer has, like, suppose I wanted to run Photoshop on my computer. Well, my computer has all kinds of stuff that have nothing to do with Photoshop, like games and stuff. 
Um, so I can put all of that to one side and have an operating system specifically for Photoshop and put that in the cloud. So now I have cloud access to Photoshop. Well, that's a neat idea. Photoshop works a lot better for me on the cloud than it ever did on my computer because Photoshop uses a whole lot of energy or a whole lot of memory, bandwidth, etc. So what if I created a whole bunch of these little boxes? One for Photoshop, one for, oh, I don't know, Word, a lot like Google Docs does, right? Uh, one for images, uh, one for writing script, or one for anything I can think of. That's the cloud. That really is the cloud. That's all the cloud is. Now take that, you have a little version of your computer running in a container. It's an optimized version of your computer running in a container. If somebody says to you the word Docker, that's all they're saying is that. Uh, and so you're accessing this container. This container runs your program. Now, it's not just running Photoshop or Word. It's running messy stuff like Jupyter Notebook, which we just talked about. So one of the things this thing in the cloud is doing is accessing data from third-party sites. It's accessing the linked open data cloud. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Is this connected to Siri? No. Um, what's happening here accords with and aligns with the principles of connectivism, but it isn't connectivism. Um, it's something that connectivism would have and did predict. <laughs> so, think about it now. I offer, or sorry, I have my Photoshop program in a little box on someone else's computer, which is really cheap. I don't use it all the time. I hardly ever use it. So what I say, I'll sell you access to my Photoshop container, or I'll give you access, it's so cheap to run. That's what cloud technology is now. So, we have out there in the world, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of these little containers running specific applications that you can access using your computer or any device and these things will in turn access live data. And they're interactive, meaning you can consume content from them, use them to create content all at once. That's what we have now. That exists now. Just beginning to impact the educational infrastructure, uh, it's a big deal in the programming development community. They're all over this. Imagine building, I promised I wouldn't talk about simulations, but can you imagine building a simulation where the only thing you're worried about is building the sim part, but you have, say, a simulated control that could connect to actual computer programs that are out there on the cloud, and then through them connect to actual data out there on the cloud. So you're getting real-time data, computer programs as needed into your simulation. That's pretty cool. Pretty interactive. How do you plan a lesson plan around that? So this is open linked data, and this is the part that's more like connectivism. The data isn't just standalone. It's not just rows and tables like in a spreadsheet. Out there in the world, things are connected to other things in your brain too. That's why it's elephant brain all the way down. Um, so you have people connected to concepts, connected to locations, connected to other people, connected to an archive, connected to concepts again, because there's no reason why you can't go around in circles, connected to RMV, whatever that is. So this whole concept of connected data informs and helps us work with this data cloud. So, that in turn is leading developers to rethink how we're offering online services uh, and online products. 
There's a movement out there called Re-Decentralize the Web. Um, a person you may have heard of, a guy called Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web, is one of the leading figures in it. He's developing something called solid, uh, social linked data. You saw the linked data part of it. Um, we now know, in a way we didn't know, say, 10 years ago, the dangers of centralized applications. And it's not just the learning management system is really crappy, although there is that. Right? But Facebook, LinkedIn, data silos, fake news, influencers, advertising for placement aside. There's a lot of talk in the previous talk about self-regulation, self-control. Very important concepts for making this all work. What happens in your centralized system when some of the central elements are not self-regulated and not self-controlled? Uh, you get chaos. You get pretty much the political environment as it exists today where the major players are not self-regulated and not self-controlled, and we have no mechanism to defend against that. And it might be friends, it might be foes, it might be third parties with whom we have no interaction, but they're behaving in this chaotic, you know, uh, chaotic neutral, as the D and D crowd would say. So, the defense against that, theory, 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 uh, is a decentralized web application, a decentralized internet generally. So we take the capacity, cloud capacity, social links, data capacity, etc., and we split everything apart. So that really basically what we've done is we've, as the title says, re-decentralized the web. You see a simple example there, photo gallery on one site, Flickr, Social feed, uh, that would be now a decentralized social feed. Meeting schedule, maybe. My pictures, and see, my world is basically interacting with all of these discrete, maybe interconnected, but certainly not centralized systems. So there's a whole ecosystem now in the process. This is now short-term future. Uh, in terms of education, it's probably longer term, 10 years. Uh, in terms of reality, six months to a year. Um, you know, we, right now, we have the single market where centralized apps with the major players, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, etc. These are all on their last legs. Well, they might survive as companies, but as technologies, their day is done. Um, Simple example, more and more people, including myself, no longer use Facebook. Um, not because, well, no, I won't go into that. <laughs> There's all kinds of wrong. It's, how many of you use Netflix? How many of you would trust your future to the Netflix recommendation algorithm? Yeah. <laughs> Therein is the problem, right? We've got a single algorithm, no matter how personalized it is, based on this centralized source making recommendations for you, and you don't know whether it's gamed or, or what, right? It's funny how the most recommended thing for me is always the thing that Netflix just released. It's a mystery to me. So, here are some examples of the decentralized social networks that are in development today. I mentioned Solid. There's the link to it. That's an image from Solid. Uh, that's a, an image of the concept behind Solid with a screenshot of an application that doesn't actually exist, but it will. Um, IndieWeb is the same concept. Uh, it uses a background protocol called ActivityPub. Basically, that's a decentralized activity notification system. Fuzz, that's a very fuzzy way of saying it. But think, from, from the perspective of uh, ADL, think uh, the uh, experience XAPI, 
experience application programming interface, right, which records your learning activity data and then puts it into a centralized learning record store. Think that, but with no centralized learning record store. Instead of sending your activity data to the boss at the center, you send your activity data to the people you're most closely connected with. The rest of the internet doesn't need it, doesn't need to know. Isn't that better? Wouldn't it be great to build a system like that? Um, Mastodon is um, a decentralized social networking application. I use it a lot. Um, it's what's called part of the Fediverse or Federated Social Networking Service. Um, so there's numerous instances of Mastodon, not just one centralized instance like Twitter, but numerous instances, but they're all interconnected. Uh, MeFi is another one. Uh, put on your content filters if you go there. Right now, we're in the process of seeing the evolution of something called Web3, where this decentralized architecture is being built in at the lowest levels of the web. It's taking Tim Berners-Lee forever to build solid. And the reason is, all of this has to be built first in order for solid to work. But watch for it. Um, and it's this reaction, these abbreviations, Interplanetary file system. <laughs> um, interplanetary, interplanetary linked data. And DAT is the protocol they'll use. I'll talk a little bit about those in, in a few slides from now. Don't worry about remembering these terminology, these terms. Although you can remember interplanetary if you want. That's pretty cool. Uh, okay. So uh, the other part of the future that everybody always, you know, they talk about virtual reality, virtual reality, etc., HoloLens, and then they talk about artif artificial intelligence this, artificial intelligence that. Um, notice my talk is mostly not those things. Artificial intelligence does play a role here. But it plays a different role than you might think. In the world of learning, they're talking about using artificial intelligence for things like learning analytics or content recommendation systems. Uh, the least interesting and most pointless uses of artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a very early phase of AI. Long term won't be a significant factor. What will be a significant factor is Artificial intelligence services of whatever type that you can just plug into. Remember I talked about containers and all these different containers that are out there and social linked data? Well, take that linked data and instead of linking it to a container of Photoshop, link it to an artificial intelligence engine. And then let that engine send you back what you need. You could do that. Um, you know, and in fact, that high school kid that's uh, doing the AI thing for his school traffic, that's what he's doing. He's not writing AI from scratch. Who would write AI from scratch? That would be stupid, right? Well, he's taking the data, he's feeding it into containerized AI services, specifically a traffic optimization algorithm, one of hundreds of thousands, of, well, maybe tens of thousands right now, of algorithms available. The hard part is finding the algorithm, right? Runs it through the algorithm, gets the output, plots the output onto the map. Done. Wasn't really harder than a trigonometry problem. Um, and the AI did all the trig for it. That's what's going to be happening. Um, in a longer version of this talk, I have a little demo that I do. Uh, where I take a picture, any picture, input it into my website, click a button, and it auto-generates a caption for that picture and metadata. Um, and all I've done is, uh, in the back end, using JavaScript only, I don't even need to use a web server, uh, I send a request to Microsoft Azure Image Recognition Service, it looks at the image, 
compares it to a whole bunch of images and background data that it has, sends me back the caption, done. Took me 10 minutes. Stephen, how, in the case of that, that student with the AI project, mm -hmm. how does that student know that what he's getting back is a quality product? If he uses a different product, that might be a better answer, or he might even have a wrong answer. But how, do you, how do you judge quality of, of product? Or? Okay, so the question was, in the case of a kid using the AI, how do you judge quality? Right? Uh, maybe there's a better product out there or whatever. The answer to that is, look at what he's trying to do. He's trying to make traffic flow better. So that gives us the answer to the question. Did the traffic flow better, yes or no? If yes... Uh, no, I, yeah, that's, that's all. <laughs> but how does he know which program to access? Uh, or okay. Because there's, there's, uh, there's thousands of, of, of uh, yeah. algorithms. How, does, how do you... That was the problem that this kid faced. I'm calling him a kid. He's probably a young adult. You know what he did? He put up a two-paragraph post on Reddit. Reddit is a social networking site asking for suggestions. And he got a bunch of suggestions. Yeah. Nobody taught him how to do that or anything. He just... Just ask. Okay. Um, now, just as an aside, social networks aren't always going to do that for you. Um, sometimes you have to search. I do a lot of my research using Google. Uh, some Google Scholar, but mostly just Google. Uh, YouTube search a lot. Um, and, and that's how people learn today. Uh, mostly. But that really is. Uh, a MOOC is just me taking my previous Google searches and stuff and organizing them into subjects. That's all it is. It really wasn't, you know, it is, it's weird because then Stanford and Harvard and that said, no, it's not good enough. We have to write all this content for MOOCs. And then, well, that's really expensive, so we have to have a business model. And so we need venture capitalist financing. And, uh, Udacity now is what they call a unicorn, just went over the billion dollar valuation. That billion dollar valuation is debt, not earnings. It owes a billion dollars to its investors. How's it going to make money? Um, what I did, I did some Google searches, listed the best results according to me on a few web pages, opened it up to everyone. I was a lot cheaper and I don't need VC funding. And that's all a MOOC is, plus the social networking part, so you can talk about it. All right. Uh, people say, hey, I could never do that. AI, there's another part of this I can't do. Uh, relentless doppelganger, because this is another thing on my bucket list, right? Go to a military conference play death metal for them. <laughs> uh, relentless do Doppelganger is an endless death metal player. It composes and plays death metal 24-7 indefinitely. It will never stop. All original. Okay, it's not great death metal. Death metal goes. There's a bunch of other things. Um, I liked, uh, well, I liked MuseNet quite a bit. Uh, I liked Taryn Southern. Uh, probably the best example of this, she uses the AI to compose the music, and then she comes up with lyrics to that, and then sings along with it. Content and creativity working together. Uh, a bunch of other AI things that we can play with, uh, Cogni, Virtual learning assistant. Uh, it has stuff in the back end, but the main AI thing it does is it has conversations with students. Uh, Squirrel is an adaptive education provider in China. Magpie is a content recommender. Again, the least interesting thing. Um, but here's interesting at the bottom. Uh, X5 Gone is fully automated creation of open educational resource courses. So. If you think about it, you don't need course search engines. 
What you need is an AI that will write the course for you on the fly when and where you need it. So if you're in instructional design or even in teaching, uh, yeah, this stuff isn't going to replace you, but it's really going to change the kind of problems that you're looking at. That'd be pretty neat. You're out there, say, in traffic, and you call up the course that will teach you how to best manage the traffic that you're in. I could have used that yesterday, driving south of the lake, or as I now call it, North Toronto. Uh, this one's pretty neat, and again, this goes back to lizard brains and elephants and things. Uh, we don't have the cognitivist content management mechanism in our brain that cognit cognitivists think that we do. We have a really complicated neural network processor, that is connectivism. And all the words and the thinking, etc., that's the rider thinking that he's in control, but he isn't. So what this does is it doesn't try to get words and concepts and all of that from your brain because it can't, because they're not there. It connects to the vocal tract, the jaw, the larynx, the lips, the tongues, the things we actually use to communicate them, to communicate whatever's behind them, and it uses those in order to auto-generate speech. Cognition, logic, reasoning, category concepts, the whole cognitivist infrastructure, those are all communications tools. We think that they are doing the thinking, but they are not. In other words, we want to train the big, messy thing in the back, a.k.a. the elephant. Trying to work these two things in it. I don't know how it's working. And how you do these things on the fly. All right, getting to the home stretch here. Can't you tell? <laughs> That's as excited as this cat gets. All right, so talked about Web 3. The graph is a concept, it's a mathematical concept, it's a social concept. It's a computational concept. That is the conceptual basis for Web3 networks. It's also the conceptual basis for thinking, but we'll leave that part aside. Graph Data Connect is an application that provides a way to interact with these graphs. And that's where a lot of these programming systems are being developed now. Graph databases, graph connection services, things like that. So, how do you make this graph work? This is some of the ugly underpinnings of it. I'm not going to linger on this, but I want you to know that it exists. This is something called a Merkle tree, a.k.a. a hash tree. Basically, this is the mechanism that's used to connect one part of the graph to another part of the graph, to another part of the graph. When somebody says blockchain to you, have you heard of blockchain? Blockchain. That's all it is. Uh, that's about half of what it is. But what's really neat about hash trees is the hash of one piece of content is used to create the next piece of content. The hash of the next piece of content is used to create the next piece of content. In other words, you're chaining the contents together. Or here, we're graphing the contents. It doesn't have to just be a chain, right? We're graphing the contents together. Here's an example of a graph. It's called, in particular, a directed acyclic graph. Directed because there's arrows. Acyclic because there's no loops. Right? So we use graphs like this to create collections of related data elements through time. Example of that, financial ledger. Example of that, coding versioning systems. Minimal viable, product, minimal, minimum viable product and agile competing uses DAGs to do version control. And you don't need to remember that, but you may have heard of GitHub. GitHub is a huge open source and open 
programming environment, open source programmers put their program onto GitHub. Other people can copy or clone these programs. They can make their own versions of the programs. That's called forking. They can make recommendations to improve someone else's program. That's called merging. And it's all managed using this cryptographic system. It's just a big Merkle graph. Remember Jupyter Textbook with code? Jupyter Textbook with code is now a thing. Came out, well, I saw it two days ago. Put it in these slides this morning. Uh, called Jupy Text, which takes the code. That's I, think, I guess I should have tested that animation first. Uh, it looked good at the start. Um, Jupy Text, what it does, you have your Jupyter Notebook. You make some changes in the computer code in your notebook. It automatically sends that to GitHub, which updates the code that you created. And most importantly, links it to all the other versions of the code. Which leads us to content addressable networking. All that is, is remember I talked about hash? Take some content, any content, run it through a hash function, you get what's called a hash value or a key. That hash value or a key is unique to that content. So if I write war and peace and run it through that algorithm, I'll get a 256 byte string unique to war and peace. If I change one comma of war and peace to a period and run it through that algorithm, I get a different version of that output. One comma in War and Peace changes the hash. And these hashes are unique to War and Peace. So we can do two things with hash. We can link data, and we can be sure that the data we've linked was the data that we put into the system. Now that would be kind of useful. I've come up with a concept which I think will be really big, and maybe not, called Content Addressable Resources for Education. So you throw the raw material into the system, pictures, clips, whatever you've created, blog posts you wrote using your WordPress LTI plugin, whatever, throw it into this network, run it through the hash, so it has a key. Now, I can send copies of my thing that I wrote to all my friends. So, so suppose I wrote a post about, or suppose I recorded this talk and sent it to you. I can do that. So each one of you has a copy of my talk. How do you know you have the right copy? Or if you send the copy to someone else, how do they know you sent the right copy? Check the hash value. If the hash matches, then you know that you have the right copy. But even better, suppose someone new walks into the room and says, I want a copy of this talk. Who do they ask? Well, anyone, right? Because you ask for it by the key, and then the closest person who has something with that key can send it to you. You don't need me. You don't need most of this network. You just need one person connected to you. I mentioned the interplanetary file system earlier. That's what it is. So everybody has a copy or a certain subset, and you ask for content by its hash value. You know you're getting the right content. It's a reliable delivery of content. So there's a lot of stuff we can do with graphs. Um, There's questions graph analytics can answer. There's a thing there, graph algorithms book is filled with algorithms we can use for graph logic and graph calculations. Um, practical examples now. This is something that we built, is something that we built, something that some other people that I don't even know built. Uh, using this technology, it's an autonomous agent communication system, um, 
and it's a blockchain-based protocol, which we now know is nothing more than a Merkle chain. In other words, a hash graph, right? Nothing more than that. And so independent things working together, like say uh, unmanned aerial vehicles can, can communicate directly with each other with a degree of security and assurance about the contents using systems like this. The question for trainers is, how would you use this in training? I haven't a clue. Affordances, right? What will the people you are training think they can use this for? That's the key question. Where would this come in handy? Here's a problem you do face, something called the Byzantine Generals problem. You have a communications network, but remember some of the people in the network, they don't tame their lizard brain. They don't respect the protocols. They are socially inept, they are socially inappropriate. In fact, they are downright nasty. They want to overthrow you, they might be Russians, they might be, well, who knows, right? So, and you're the Byzantine commander, you're getting a whole bunch of conflicting information from all of these different generals. The communications are good. They're using a hash network. So you know the message is, if it's coming from a general, you know that general sent it. It was signed digital. But who's right? If you try to manage something like this, you're going to run into difficulties. What the solution that blockchain and a lot of these technologies propose is something called a consensus algorithm. You let the network figure it out. There are different kinds of consensus algorithms. This is all fluid stuff. Uh, proof of burn, proof of work, which is what Bitcoin uses. Proof of stake, which is what Ethereum is working toward, etc. Some of these are efficient, some of these are not. Some of these are trustworthy, some of these are not. It's a moving target. When this is cracked, and it will be cracked, we know it can be done now because Bitcoin works. So when it's cracked in an efficient and scalable manner, which is the real problem today, we'll have mechanisms for addressing the Byzantine generals problem. And so we'll be able to use what this slide calls blockchain-based, although I would say hash graph-based, uh, protocols for autonomous business activities, smart contracts, all of that. But I'm thinking, you know, in your context, you're looking at this for autonomous agent interactivity. Individuals in the field, uh, tools that are in the field, equipment, whatever, able to communicate on a peer-to-peer -peer basis such that this peer-to-peer -peer network can access resources as needed and draw consensus about a state of affairs in the field without relying on centralized authority or trust mechanisms. Now when that happens, and it will happen, it's in this process of happening, that will be significant. And when that happens, learning and development takes on a completely different perspective. It's definitely not about remembering content. It's definitely not about acquiring skills and competencies. You don't even know what the competencies are. There's a competency out there, it's unnamed. It's the key competency for this scenario. You don't know what it is, but at the point of need, you need to train for it. This kind of network is what's needed to provide for that. So, we are the thread that runs through this web of data. We, us individuals, students, learners, all of us. That's the world as it exists now. The world no longer exists in terms of uh, you know, uh, management and control, even self-control. It really is all elephant brain. Extended intelligence is the future. Working with these kind of decentralized systems. These systems will create learning resources for you on the fly. You don't need to look, worry about searching, finding, etc. You need to learn how to work with resources that will create themselves when you need them. 
And most importantly, remember, it really is, this whole system, nothing but cat pictures, right? And if it doesn't work with cat pictures, it's not going to work. Thank you.